in on the ground floor or deciding to do a franchise at all, we were looking at long-term resale value. That had a huge impact on our decision to buy into mm. a franchise. We didn't want to be owning three Jordan Murray dog places and trying to sell those as individuals at some point when we look to retire. We wanted to have a known quantity that could demand a premium and you know have value in the marketplace at that point in time. And you're, you're actually rolling the dice from the standpoint that the Camp Bow Wow grows to send that versus going the other way. True. And, and then which basically has the, the recourse. So you're rolling the dice on that concept. But we believe in the concept. Yeah. We believe in the system. Yeah. So we feel like, and you need to believe in the system you buy into. You can't just do it because you think the dollars are good. You have to believe in the concept as they define it, because otherwise you'll just be miserable doing something the way someone else wants you to. And, and you I would have say to have the to leadership. Be. You need to believe in the leadership. Like mm, you yeah, said, right. you're, it keeps evolving, and that's, that's critical. I mean, one of the, the interesting dichotomies is that on, on, on sometimes one, some of the points you may not like, that, that you may not like the most in the franchise agreement are what make the system itself that much stronger. Mm -hmm. And so therefore you ultimately need to be thrilled with the fact that every 10 or 15 years the franchisor can come along and say, listen, you're going to have to, you know, at the end of your term, we can require you to remodel. I mean, there's many franchises that went downhill because they years ago didn't have that in their, in their disclosure documents. And so, you know, you, when you go to certain restaurants or establishments, but, you know, more so in those restaurants, you expected a certain quality. And when that starts to drop off because they haven't upgraded their their setup and uh, just their whole environment for 20 years, it's a bad message for every, you know, every franchise of that, of that type. Yeah, and I, I think you hit on a key point. It's, you know, as they always say in business, you have to change. And sometimes the franchisers get so established that everybody sees it the same and then, but eventually they start losing customers because it looks old. And right. I, I look at McDonald's right now, literally tearing down at the location totally tearing down and rebuilding on the same location, a totally new identity right. uh, from right. that. And, I, you know, and I'm sitting there saying, okay, they've discovered I'm at the point where I have to sit here and make myself different to keep that customer base coming to me. Right, and uh, McDonald's has been around forever, but they're doing a really nice job of reinventing themselves. Yeah, right. Right. And, and that's an excellent point that you pointed out, Ken, that a lot of people don't think about when they go to uh, a mature market. I was curious also, uh, Jordan, did they uh, assist you any with actually understanding your target audience at all? Or were you kind of left on your own who to go find and things like that? Um, they helped us with coming up with a model of where to locate relative to our target audience. Okay. Um, we have since really defined it. Again, that was a stage one franchise right. when we got in. I don't think they knew that much about who they were specifically catering to. Mm -hmm. We were the only, uh, the second out of state franchise. Okay. So everything prior to us had been in Colorado and one in Michigan. So the people in Colorado are, are different than the people in Pennsylvania. But we've had national surveys that have gone out to all our clients. We have a much better idea of who who uses us, and we have two very different clients, one for boarding, one for daycare. Um, uh, we were just talking about this earlier. Our daycare client is uh, women who may or may not be married but don't have any children in the home at that moment. That tends to be the sweet spot for us of, mm -hmm. um, you know, people who, who value their dogs and, you know, want to bring them in for that daycare socialization element. And that's an excellent point. How about John, with you, the, the franchisers you deal with, do they help a lot with target audience focus? or? And, and, and again, it p depends on the evolution of the okay. franchise, uh, you know, as Jordan said. Um, I, I think most really try to do that in some way or, or another. Um, you know, they'll, they'll, they have a demographic department. They'll, they'll carve out the demographics in a, in a, or they'll outsource it, mm -hmm. uh, where they'll really kind of define the market for that particular territory. It, they actually can't carve it out unless they know the demographics. Mm. So uh, it's in their interest to do that, and they'll 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 be pretty specific on it. And then they'll have you know obviously a marketing department how to reach that that demographic as well. Um, early stage companies sometimes outsource that, but but by and large, most of them have a pretty pretty established. I mean, it's the meat and potatoes of their 
mm -hmm. of the franchise is trying to make make sure that that franchisee is successful when he's when he's up and running it, and that's the service you're buying with, with that royalty fee. Ken, when you look at documents and that, do you see sometimes franchisors, especially those that really go into what we call a, a growth mode and really taking off across the country or region, um, that sometimes it's, they lose sight of who that target audience is and all of a sudden we start seeing the doors close on a bunch of them that were just bought? Do you see that? You know what, most of the ones that have been in a growth mode, they get it. Mm -hmm. And so if I see them in a growth mode, and John could probably speak to this more than I can, if they're, in a, if they're hitting stage three, three, mm -hmm. four, five, they get it. Mm -hmm. And um, so they're, they're, they're adapting. Mm -hmm. I think, I'm guessing that a lot of the franchises, and again, John, maybe you know, probably get more stuck in stage one or two. I think if they keep going, I, then once they hit a certain stage, you know, you and you can tell pretty much early on in the negotiations, I get a sense of the leadership and how forward thinking they are. And you know, they're, they're, you hear that they're constructing a new huge building and just the, the, I guess the level of sophistication and experience comes out pretty quick. Carl, I think you were, I think you're alluding to maybe where they've oversaturated or there's cannibalization going yeah. on and, and they haven't, they haven't enforced either their territorial agreements or, or, or uh, and, and you do see that with, with a fast growth uh, mm -hmm. franchise. But again, it goes back to the leadership mm -hmm. and, and how, how much they're gonna enforce that contract uh, where they've, they've defined the territory. If they've let cannibalization occur, uh, then, then shame on the franchise or, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's not a good situation. That's a red flag for someone who's looking and, and he sees failing franchises, mm -hmm. it has to be disclosed on the document. If you see an excessive number uh, of failures, that, that's uh, a, a red flag, mm -hmm. stay away. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I was curious about when you're talking about the aspect of leadership, have um, John, Ken, you ever, either of you been involved where there's actually been a transition to new leadership? Yes. And, and how that has gone? I've seen the, the gamut. Uh -huh. I've seen it where it's failed mm -hmm. miserably, mm -hmm. where there was a, a, a hostile takeover um, and the new owner uh, provided no support and created uh, a really bad situation for his franchisees. Um, and they, they, quite frankly, they sought legal help uh, to, to exit the contract. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've seen others where it's been an infusion of, of capital, uh, uh, just a, a, a whole fresh change. Um, and, and it's it, it, a large organization bought a smaller one mm -hmm. and, it, and it was good for everybody. They were cross-selling between the different franchises. So it, it, it's gone the gamut. It, it, whenever there's a change, there's, there's going to be some anxiety. And you've really got to, there's really not much you can do while that's going on at a corporate level. That's the, the, one of the, the problems in the franchise system. Uh, ultimately, you can do something, but at least while that's all going on, it's, uh, it, it's just a big transition, and hopefully it, it, it come, you come out okay on it. You know? yeah, my, my experience has been, well, with the, representing a franchisee, that's a relatively short period of time, at least as far as the negotiation of the agreement. I mean, I don't, I, I, you know, I, I tell my clients, you don't need to pay, you need to decide which franchise you want to be comfortable before you start having me, you don't want me to look at three disclosure documents and come right. back to you and say, here's right. which one I think is right for you. So, right. you know, it's a, it's a two week, three week, you know, month long process or even, you know, a week, it can, you know, mm -hmm. depending upon the, whatever the urgency is. I've been lucky that with the franchisors that I've represented, the transition has always been, you know, pretty smooth and voluntary. Um, but one of the things when I represent a, a potential franchisee is I like to, I want to make sure that um, that the, the the leadership is locked up in a certain way that they're not that, that that one of the leaders can't say, "Hey, this is a great idea. I'm just going to go over, you know, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to start, you know, camp, you know, doggy woggy." Um, Online, you know, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so you know, I like to sometimes dig in and say, "Well, how do you know this is the you figure out who's the main guy and who's." Who, does the, who do the potential franchisees really have the confidence in? And we need to make sure that that person's gonna stick around. 
And the, the leader of Camp Bow Wow was the one that we met with when we first got introduced. And she absolutely gave us confidence. We, we had never dealt with a franchise before, but we had known family members who had been in scenarios where they had their market cannibalized, similar to what we were talking about earlier. And the woman who owns um, the Camp Bow Wow franchise is just such an amazing person and her vision was there and we could see it and it was all about the dogs while being financially successful. That was a huge selling point for us and we believe in her as much as the system as a whole. And, and that's so important, mm -hmm. you know, as part of the whole assessment process. Jordan, uh, with the roughly, I guess, 77 or close to 100 Camp Bow Wows, they are, do you, are you in communications? Do you have like annual meeting or anything where you actually discuss ideas or things you see or challenges? Um, yeah, 120 Camp Bow Wows, I oh, believe, okay. is the number that's open okay. right now. But uh, we do have annual meetings that we go to, and um, we're just getting to the size where they're starting to talk about implementing some regional meetings, which would be okay. nice to get together on a more frequent basis with some of our co-franchisees who are in similar markets to our own. Okay. Um, New York City is going to be very different from Pittsburgh right. and so forth. Uh, but we really value that opportunity to meet with other franchisees in the system, mm -hmm. give, give feedback to them when they ask us questions and, and seek feedback from them, in addition to get re-energized and motivated um, it's a lot of it is is cheerleading, so that we we all get back in that growth and and customer service type mentality. And uh, Jordan, uh, correct me. You see um, Pittsburgh kind of being on a, a gamut of a, a growth concept, where everybody's kind of always looked at Pittsburgh as decline, especially for the target audience you're describing. And now, kind of with everything dynamically that's happening in the region one, all the positive press, mm -hmm. and two, the um, natural gas industry and all that has just shown this huge potential growth market that seems to fit well where, where your market's at right now. Pittsburgh has been very good to us. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of positives. Uh, all the things that you've just mentioned have been very positive for us. In addition, we didn't know this when we opened, but the geography of Pittsburgh uh, the layout of the city has benefited us. The fact that people travel a lot during the summer has benefited us in March break. Um, our Green Tree Camp has uh, been very successful. In fact, this month we are the number one grossing camp in the system. Congratulations. And, and we're typically in the top five. So, you know, Pittsburgh is a great place to open a business right now. Um, a very strong economy relative to the national. Does the uh, rivers work in your favor? I believe I believe it does. Okay. Um, we like we like a centralized workforce downtown, uh -huh. and I think the rivers contribute to that. So people still tend to work downtown in Pittsburgh, which isn't the case in every market. What do you attribute being number one to? Uh, we do the health of the, the economy cannot be downplayed. It's very important to the business. The location of that camp is phenomenal as far as locations go. Um, uh, we do a lot of marketing, a lot of grassroots marketing is big for us. We go to every community day, every show we can possibly mm -hmm. get ourselves into to get that face-to-face -face time because our concept is new and is different. And although it's becoming mainstream, we a lot of times have to teach people what doggy daycare is. And so a traditional advertising format of 30-second video or, or print ad doesn't convey why we're not just a boarding place. So we really do a lot of our marketing grassroots based. And if we can spend five minutes with someone, they understand how great a value Camp Bow Wow is and how there pretty much is no better place for even remotely close to as little money as we charge mm -hmm. for, for the benefit our dogs of their dogs. Have, have stayed there and, and we were talking about how, you know, you go away and you, you know, the one thing you feel bad about is, is that you're leaving your dog. And a lot of times we try to go away and we find places where our dogs are, you know, able to, to, to mm -hmm. uh, go with us. but. Yeah, there you can, you can see how they're doing. You see they're playing, and yeah. it, it is a different concept. We were talking beforehand about it's a matter of educating people about this is different than the I guess that what was you know considered the traditional kennel. Yeah, and it also opens up some freedom as you talk about. If you want to travel, you have to look at where you're going, and will they let me have my pets? Mm -hmm. And right. that, and so I mean, it, it becomes much more challenging unless you know you have something where you actually can. 
one, you know they're going to take care of it. One, two, you can visually see it anytime you want to see how they're doing and things like that. So Plus the due diligence that they do for each dog is, yeah. is it, you, you can't just show up and say, hey, I'm dropping off my dog. I think it's great that they do the due diligence not only on that the shots are up to date, but that the dog's temperament mm -hmm. is, is good for being in playtime. Yeah, we interview every dog. They have to come in for a free day of daycare, which gives us a chance to get to know them and make sure they are a social vaccinated, spayed or neutered dog. Mm -hmm because that's what makes it fun, mm -hmm. is those dogs that go there aren't in fear of you know, being attacked by another dog or right. um, you know, anything else. It's absolute fun, and all the dogs that, that end up coming back to camp more than once or twice, our customers tell us all the time, as soon as they turn onto the roadway near us, mm -hmm. the dogs get all excited and they get up and they're, you know, they just wanna get to camp. Yeah, it's amazing how they, they know those uh, type things. Now, do you turn dogs away? No, we absolutely do. Mm -hmm. um, it's a small percentage. Usually we end up having to convince people to come in mm -hmm. because they think, oh, my dog's not good enough to pass mm -hmm. because maybe they bark at the door when they're at home or they bark at another dog when they're walking them on a leash. Mm -hmm. And we have to more overcome, no, no, give us a chance to get to know your dog in a neutral environment. We'll, we'll, we'll introduce him first to a male and then to a female one-on-one -on -one, and then into the to the play group and then we'll watch them for three hours and at the end of that time we'll let you know how they did let us take responsibility mm -hmm. but we maybe maybe have five percent mm -hmm. of our interviews that don't end up passing when you were talking about earlier about the marketing what percentage of your budget spent on marketing uh, what percentage of our entire budget mm -hmm. a relatively small one mm -hmm. uh, labor is by far our biggest expense yeah, because we do that much. maintain a 15 to 1 ratio at okay. all times between dogs and campers mm -hmm. so between two camps we have 50 employees that work for us so mm -hmm. I mean that's a big part uh, real estate is a big part mm -hmm. and um, I, I don't feel comfortable giving you okay. a marketing number off the top I, I, of my Like head. I said I was just curious because you were talking about that and that's always a, a thing that a lot of people don't take into account that I got to figure marketing dollars. Well, you know, well absolutely. Uh, and maybe I can address okay. that. Even from a franchise aspect, mm -hmm. most of them will put in a requirement of X amount percentage. Okay. Has to be spent, and, and a minimum uh -huh. of 2%, uh, and they call it the, the ad fund. Okay. And that can be spent usually locally. Uh, they may say 2% and, two, and maybe 1% nationally, which would go to national uh, television shows or publications and that sort of thing. It's something that a lot of uh, potential franchisees don't really understand when they get in. And it's, it's disclosed in the document, right. but it's, it's another expense, but, but it's for their own good. Right. And, and they're saying that in order to be successful, you need to spend you know, this 2% minimum to, to be successful. So, but One of the areas that I you know, always ask the franchisor to clarify, in many of these instances, it may not even be a, a, a brick and mortars facility. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to make sure that that marketing not only goes for the commercials, but can they use that for their networking? Because at the end of the day, in certain instances, that's what the customer is, is buying. Mm -hmm. you, they need to be able to connect with, with the, the, fran the individual franchisee. Right. The, the franchisor actually uh, reserves the right to audit uh, their books, too, to see if they are doing that expenditure as well. Well, and I think that's excellent because I, I know that uh, dealing with uh, just regular small businesses, mm -hmm. they never put that into their budget. Right. It's just like it's right. totally oblivious. Yeah. And it's like, mm -hmm. what's the dollar allocation? You know, what percentage of your dollars are you going to use? Oh, well, I'm just going to choose events that are affordable. I said, no, you yeah. can't do it that right. way. And it's the catch-22 that when business is bad, they don't yeah. want to spend the marketing dollars. Right. Well, then business isn't going to get a whole lot better. Yeah. Yeah, you been, have to spend money to make money. And, and it's been yeah. our experience that the the lesser threshold camps are the ones that are not spending the marketing dollars and are not getting out of camp to go market themselves. Mm -hmm. So we we totally agree with that concept. Well, I, I, I remember and it was unfortunate, but because uh, Toyota finally got all the bad press, but I remember when 2008 when everything started really going down, Toyota really upped its dollars to be seen. And right now the model is actually Nissan, Nissan's basically, just really up this dollar, so it's highly visible. So it just becomes, rolls off the tongue. What did you last see? Mm -hmm. And it's a great concept, and that's the reality. You know, people are gonna remember what they see most. 
And that's why I said, you know, with your active going out there in the public eye, that's what people are going to immediately roll off their tongue when somebody says, do you know some place where I can actually put my dog? You know, right. it, it's just going to roll off. So it, it's to your added benefits. I think that's tremendous. A lot of people see the uh, royalty as whatever plus one or two for the national marketing fee, and they think that the franchisor is going to do all the marketing for them. Yeah. But but. That on a national scale, unless you are in one of the biggest franchises, doesn't mean anything is going to happen in your local market. Mm -hmm. Especially on a stage one or two franchise where they're really not doing national advertising yeah. at all. You know, so that really it's all, all about your local dollar marketing. So. Yeah. Well, let's take a minute and look at some of the photos that were done, um, that were sent in. And so uh, those should be coming up shortly here. Um, so, Jordan, you go ahead and... This is our Green Tree facility just off the parkway in Green Tree, and it's uh, 10,000 square feet with 6,000 square feet of indoor outdoor play space. So, how many dogs can you take? Um, we have 70 cabins here. Okay. And some of those might be double occupancy, and we might have um, some, well, we would have some daycare in addition. Okay. Um, in the summer, the peak time, we might end up having 120 dogs at, at the oh, wow. most during okay. the day. All right. But typically, we'll probably average during the year 70 or 80 dogs. Okay. So is this the These medium dog our, group or the large dog group? or? What? Uh, we actually group them, uh, after the smalls, we group them more by temperament. Oh, temperament. Where okay. we'll have like the highly active chase play uh -huh. group of dogs. Where I could relate to those. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have the more relaxed, calm play area where it's for the dogs that uh, are really there for light socializing, not so much physical activity. Okay. This is our North Hills, the entrance to our North Hills facility, which is on Babcock Boulevard, just off of McKnight Road in the uh, former USA Baby. A lot of people know that. And here again, we have about, uh, about 6,000 square feet and about 70 cabins. They're two of the larger sized facilities in the franchise. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And this is our lobby layout. We have a check-in area on the right and a, check, or, uh, and a check-out area on the left. And then our desk is right in between where our staff sits, sort of a condensed image. And is there somebody there 24 hours a, a day, or it's 12 uh, hours? Uh, how's it work? No, we're, we're open to the public from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m., Okay. Uh, almost seven days a week. Sunday, we have a split shift in the middle where we shut down, but we are open 365 days a year. Uh, in the evenings, we actually don't have anyone stay by franchise policy. Mm -hmm. The reason is, when all these dogs have been out playing all day and you put them back mm. in their cabins, they want to come back out and continue to play. As long right. as we're there, they're saying, let me out, come on, I want to interact yeah. with you. Uh, even though we make their cabins very nice with cots and police blankets and mm. Kongs with peanut butter and cookies as mm. bedtime treats and classical music. Yeah. You know, we do everything for all the dogs to make, <laughs> to make it appealing. They still want to go back out and play. They then stay up all night uh -huh. and you put them back out in those play groups the next day well, now they're exhausted, and uh -huh. you're putting them in with all these other dogs, you end up with fights. So what uh -huh. we do instead is we have all our facilities monitored for temperature alarms, uh -huh. for motion detectors, for breaks, uh, you know, door uh -huh. break, window breaks, and even for water uh -huh. uh, in case of any sort of flooding. Uh -huh. So everything's actively monitored. We always have um, a staff member that lives within the vicinity of the facility, and, you know, we get notified immediately, or the police or fire or whoever do. Okay. Now, I was curious, the uh, setup of those, do you have to have a special ventilation system or is it a, a standard system? Um, it is not a requirement of our franchise to have um, anything specific other than we maintain, uh, you know, we have full HVAC, right. so we maintain a narrow window of temperature for the dogs okay. in, in the main space. Oh, fantastic. Well, like I said, it's been educational for me learning one, about Camp Bow Wow, and then learning the ins and outs about franchises and franchisers. I could go on talking about other things that are running through my head right now, but it's time for us to wrap up. Ken, Jordan, John, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule and be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Appreciate it. Thank wow. you. And hopefully today you learned something about franchises, and if you're thinking about going into that market, here's some resources that you can actually contact and get involved with and hopefully they can get you on the right track. And if you've decided that you'd rather be independent and start your own, there's no problem with that either because there's plenty of resources there to help you. And as you go forward, please remember something. 
Your goal is always to become a 212 company. A 212 company is, think of boiling water. Boiling water boils a 212. At 211, it's good, but it doesn't really do anything. At 212, it boils, it creates steam, and it does all kinds of fantastic things. That's what kind of company you want to come someday, just like Camp Bow Wow here with Jordan. Thank you so much. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.